Rosemont people here in the back, you know what you need to do. Come on. Move down, please. There's images involved. I'm an art historian. I have a vested interest in getting you here so that you can actually see. Also, it's, it's nicer for our speaker. She gets to see your faces. Some of these lights are so bright. Especially because Michelle Ortiz is an alumna of Rosemont College. She wants to see some of the current students. Well, you're making an effort, but I meant down here. <laughs> it's closer. It's closer. Come on, guys. Come on. Wow, there's a lot of it. I just assumed that this was all cool. No, no, no. Can you write? This is the front row. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can solve it. Sit in front of church. We soon show you coming into the practice that you're not going to beat anybody. lecture. I uh, just explained that uh, Michelle Ortiz is an alumna. She got her master's uh, here at Rosemont and um, is a very, very well-known uh, Philadelphia artist, has taken part in the mural projects, uh, which I know that some of you know a lot about. Uh, Michelle, we have a whole course on the, on the mural project. So uh, without any further ado, I will ask for Dr. Preddy to give a formal introduction. You're next, right? Okay, okay, okay. Um, but I did want to uh, welcome you all and to explain that, Dr. Preddy, this, this lecture is being co-sponsored by the Campus Mission and Ministry and by the Institute for Ethical Leadership and Social Responsibility. And so Dr. Preddy has agreed to do the introduction. Thank you. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us this evening. Michelle Angela Ortiz is a visual artist, skilled muralist, community arts educator who uses her art as a vehicle to represent people and communities whose histories are often lost or co-opted. Her work tells stories using richly crafted and emotive imagery to claim and transform spaces into a visual affirmation that reveals the strength and spirit of the community. For over 18 years, Ms. Ortiz has used the arts as a tool for communication to bridge communities. As a highly skilled muralist, she has designed and created over 50 large-scale public works nationally and internationally. Since 2008, Ms. Ortiz has led community building and art for social change public art projects both independently in Costa Rica and Ecuador, and through the United States Embassy as a cultural envoy in Fiji, Mexico, Argentina, Spain, Venezuela, and Honduras. In Cuba, she completed the first U.S. state-funded public art project since the reopening of the United States Embassy in Havana in 2015. Ms. Ortiz is a recent Rauschenberg Foundation artist, as activist fellow, a Kennedy Center Citizen Artist National Fellow, and a Santa Fe Art Institute Evil Justice Resident Artist. In 2016, she received the Americans for the Arts' Public Art Year in Review Award, which honors outstanding public arts projects in the nation. She is also a fellow of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture Fund for the Arts, recipient of the Leeway Foundation Transformation Award and Art and Change Grant. She holds a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Moore College of Art and Design, and as President Hirsch just mentioned, a master's degree in science of arts and cultural management from Rosemont College. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Angelo Ortiz. so that all of you can stay home. 
awake and engaged. Um, so uh, thank you. I'm, I'm so honored to be here with all of you. Thanks uh, to the um, president and to also Alan and, and for folks in, in inviting me to come here and to share uh, my work with all of you. Um, in 2002 was when I had uh, received my master's in arts and cultural management and it seemed to be a very nice flow from being a studio artist and wanting to know more about what it meant to uh, kind of navigate and move through these nonprofit arts organizations that I was working with. So the tools that I've learned uh, through my master's degree has actually helped me a lot uh, within the work that I've been doing as an artist because I'm able to manage very large projects uh, and understand uh, the, the realities of not just um, creating new work, but funding new work, how to ask for funding, how to uh, get the support that I need. That's very much important within um, uh, creating a sustainable life as an artist. Um, so I'm just going to be sharing with you a presentation. I tend to talk a lot more. Uh, so I'm going to keep, keep to my notes, um, but I want to make sure that we have enough time uh, for questions and for dialogue after um, the presentation. So uh, thank you all for being patient and for being present. And, uh, and don't be shy to also move a little bit closer if you need to, <laughs> or even when, we, when it comes time for uh, the discussion, you can definitely move a little bit closer. I can't move the mic around, so I definitely want to be uh, engaged with all of you too. So thank you. So I am the daughter of immigrants. I am the strength of the women who came before me. I am the broken community, forgotten and ignored. I am the beautiful community, transformed and illuminated. I am a small woman who creates great things. And I am a catalyst for change. I come from a family of workers and immigrants where arts and culture is part of our daily life. I say this because as a child, I didn't visit galleries or museums to access art. Art was constantly around me. From listening to the traditional songs, the bolero sung from my father, who's from Puerto Rico, to creating paper flowers in the kitchen with my grandmother, I define these things, uh, these things as art that become a part of our everyday life. At a very young age, I was aware of the social, economic inequalities that exist within the communities of origin of my parents and our communities now. At the age of seven, I traveled abroad for the first time to Colombia. Uh, this was in the, in the 1980s, in the height of drug violence, both in the United States and in Colombia. And a lot of people criticized my parents because they thought that they were putting us in danger. So that first trip abroad really impacted me and partly influenced my perspective as an artist working in communities. So growing up in Philly, uh, in South Philly, S-O-U-F, if you're from South Philly, from my hood. Um, <laughs> we stayed within our block. So basically, I rode my bicycle from one block, from one end of the block to the other. Um, because as new immigrants, they weren't really trusting of our city. During my trip to Colombia, in a place labeled as one of the most dangerous countries at that time, I felt the most free that I ever had. And there was a sense of community there. There was a sense of feeling safe and belonging and, and a feeling that I could go anywhere. So it wasn't until that trip that I understood the spiritual richness of the people that shine brighter than the poverty that surrounded them. And the children with no shoes and holes in their clothing were the very same children who became my friends and had a desire and willingness to learn. These same children were also reflections of who my parents once were. Um, so the images that, I'm just, that I've been showing, these are some of the works that I do in my studio. Um, I also do prints. The, this piece right now is in permanent, at the permanent collection at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. And the image at the far right is actually the image of my mother when she first came to the United States at age 17. And she was able to see this image for the first time last year in the center as part of their, uh, the permanent collection. So these inequalities, as I just mentioned, pushed my parents to leave their homelands, to come to a country where they could have access to educational resources and employment while still enduring discrimination. As a child of immigrants, as a product of two people that experience extreme violence and poverty and 
migrated to this country for a better opportunity, I carry those triumphs and struggles with me. And because of these experiences, I see myself and my family reflected in the communities that I work with. I also understand that when I rise, they rise with me. And so it is within this context that I see my work as an artist as cultural currency, that I use my work to invest back into the communities that I feel connected with, and I intentionally place my art in public space to say we are here, we have been here, and this is what we contribute to our society and to our country, to this country. <laughs> um, my inspiration um, really comes from the importance of telling stories. Uh, as an artist, knowing about Marcel Duchamp is as equally as important as knowing about my grandmother's struggles. And so I believe that the walls of a neighborhood or uh, any public space, any walls in public space, are as important as the walls of a gallery or a museum. So for over 18 years, I continue to create work in non-traditional spaces, engaging communities in the creative process, making my work accessible to the public, and addressing critical issues that provoke empathy, that create awareness, and spark action, and try to do it in a way that's both poetic and powerful. So in this case, in this particular image, um, I'm working with uh, self-taught artists and uh, graffiti artists um, in Havana, Cuba. And so the, the act of having folks come around and to begin to even just think about how to adapt or change public space um, is something that is revolutionary in Cuba because of who actually owns public space. You know, you have the government and then you have the people. And so the challenges of having to navigate through these systems and through these spaces um, is something that I have had, have had to learn throughout the 18 years of doing this work. In 2012, I created the Akia Young Transnational Mural Project that explored the impact of immigration on the lives of young Mexican immigrants in South Philadelphia in relation to the young uh, Mexican youth in both Juarez and Chihuahua City in Mexico. So the idea of Akina Ya uh, came about um, my trips back and forth to Juarez and Chihuahua um, through various interactions with family members, both here, both in Philadelphia, and also uh, through these trips that I was already doing in these border towns, but that was through the support of the United States uh, Embassy and through the Cultural Envoy Program. Um, so what I found was that uh, there was a lot of programming already already exist that existed in Philadelphia that really focused on. Um, trying to preserve the Spanish language, so Spanish classes, learning about Mexican history, learning about the folklore dances, and, and preserving that part of the culture. But there was very little programming that really addressed the trauma or the issues related to immigration, right? The, the shock of uh, leaving one, one homeland at the age of eight or 10 years old uh, to then come to a city and be reunited with your parents that you haven't seen for that amount of time. Uh, so trying to build that family dynamic and at the same time learn English, go back to school, and, and find out how is, it, how is your life now going to be in this new city. And so that was the main reason why I created the Akinaya Project as a, a step forward in trying to address some of those issues. So in the mural, what you see is the portrait of a young immigrant. Uh, her name is Diana. At the age of 11, she crossed the border and she shares in a documentary that I created her story and how she came, how she came to um, Philadelphia for the first time. And it was also her first time in sharing her story. Uh, surrounded by the map of South Philadelphia, the image of Diana represents the immigrant child that has reached the United States. And each panel around the circle, so each one of these little panels that you see around the circles, were created by uh, eight to ten teenagers in Philadelphia that had arrived and had crossed the border, and also eight to ten teenagers in both Juarez and Chihuahua City that attempted to cross the border but remained stuck in these border towns. Um, and so what was great about this mural was that we were able to really combine both of these panels uh, from, from the youth on both sides of the border um, and to be able to really represent their story. The limitations that they had were basically the size and the palette of colors. 
Um, but in terms of the messaging, how, what was the imagery that they wanted to use, uh, the design of the panel itself, that was all based on each child, each student, e each teenager that then shared their story. Throughout this process, what I wanted to share was that there was, there was a moment of healing, very several moments of healing. So when we think about, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, when we think about art and social change, um, a lot of times people think, well, th there's these waves of change that happen, or this big, humongous change that happens. And what I've seen throughout the work that I've done is that there, there are there's these smaller waves of moments of change that happen within the individuals, that happen even with me, that happen within the people that run these institutions or run an embassy and have different expectations of the community. And so this is just one example of a moment of change that one student who was very angry at his mother for bringing him to the United States, for bringing him to Philadelphia, and if you look at it and you think about the perspective is that a lot of these teens were afraid to even share the fact that they didn't want to be here um, because they felt that their parents would view them as being ungrateful. That the parents have gone through so much sacrifice to bring them to, to a country that they could have a better opportunity. And for their child to say, I would rather be back home in Mexico with my grandmother or with my friends and my family, um, is, it can be seen as something that is disrespectful. So one thing that Aki and Ayam was able to do was create a space where the students could very easily share their experience and, and kind of build community amongst each other to be able to find that support and not be judged based on what their perspective was or their feelings. In the case of uh, Freddy, who's one of the students, um, he was very angry with his mother because his grandmother had passed away when he had left, uh, he had arrived to Philadelphia, and he promised his grandmother that he would return. But at such a young age, he really didn't understand what it meant to be undocumented, uh, how hard it was to go back to go see his grandmother. Um, and so he, he was very angry um, at, at his mother, and, um, and was very angry at the fact that he could no longer see, or, or at that moment, take care of his grandmother. Um, so it, what I proposed to him was to use one of his panels as a tribute to his grandmother and not just think of how does he honor his grandmother through the actual panel, but how does he honor his grandmother through the actions that he can, the decisions that he continues to make in his life. And so this is, these are the words that he had uh, shared um, and this is his grandmother in the center and it's part of the mural as a tribute to her. So as I was going back, these were this is an example of the, the other half of the mural with the panels created by the students uh, that had attempted to cross the border. Um, and a lot of the families are coming from indigenous communities. The majority of the families that are um, uh, undocumented immigrants are coming from Puebla uh, and from indigenous communities coming into Philadelphia. And what happens is that when they go to the border towns, which is very different from where they're coming from, even within the country of Mexico, um, they also face a lot of discrimination uh, and they also face a lot of hardship in trying to get new jobs and, and uh, assimilating within that space in itself. Um, so what, when so this idea of Akina, yeah, I was able to travel back and forth and these stories that are being represented are back and forth. Um, it is this perspective of going back and forth, Aki and Aya, here and there. Um, but one of the things that I realized too is that although when I did go back to Mexico, when I did go and visit some of the families, I could see the impact that it had on the families where the children had shoes, the children were able to go to school, they had food at their table, they were able to pay rent because they had family members here in the United States to be able to help and support them. But if we look at the bigger picture, um, the, the personal sacrifice is so huge because although the child has everything he or she needs, they still do not have a parent next to them, right? And they still don't have that relationship with them. So that's, that, that's what I talk about in terms of um, the impact of immigration on the lives of our communities and how do we find spaces of healing uh, to make that happen. So I'm going to share with you a very quick uh, time lapse of uh, the creation of the Akinaya mural, which you can see anytime you're visiting, visiting Philadelphia, it's on six, uh, and it's on Sixth Street between Tasker and Dickinson. <laughs>
fast. Hurry up. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that you know the importance of having the image of Diana there is is so important in the sense of in our we're always constantly bombarded by so many images, not just in the media. In, our, in the spaces, in the public spaces that we're constantly moving through. And so to have an image of Diana in a community where she's newly arrived, um, but also is so much connected to so many of the other immigrant communities that have settled within that space, um, is so important and it's so important when we talk about it um, in terms of the narrative of immigration, right? And how do we, how do I find, for me it's what I try to do, is how do I find the human story that really connects to the mother, the daughter, the child that's been affected, instead of looking at the statistics of how many people are coming both in and out of our countries, understanding really the root causes of immigration. So um, the largest murals I've done abroad have been in Mexico. Um, Mexico boasts of its indigenous culture and tourists coming to see the temples and ancient uh, frescoes. But the reality is, is that the living, breathing indigenous people are discriminated against. And so because of that, I uh, actually worked with a, a nonprofit arts organization that's called Habitajes uh, in Mexico City and worked with both the Masawa and the Otomi communities indigenous communities who have struggled greatly. These two communities have fought from, for 15 to 20 years uh, for the right to have decent housing, and they left their hometowns because of also the lack of opportunities uh, as they migrated to Mexico City. So this is a migration within Mexico City. They experienced violence and also feared for the safety of their children. A lot of the, these women um, would be in the streets selling some of their um, uh, clothing or their beads and would have their children with them and a lot of the, their young children were kidnapped as they were trying to provide uh, a better life for their families. So throughout my process, and just to kind of show you a little bit of process, and what I'm about to show you is a project that was, is a mural that was created in two weeks. But I say this in terms of uh, the, two, the work did not start in those two weeks. I worked along with Habitajes, who had done this, um, done a series of conversations and workshops, and um, and really built on the, uh, creating that trust with the community for six months. So, so I say that because I don't want people to think that I just insert myself and all of a sudden it's magical and everything happens and it's awesome, right? That um, <clears throat> that there's time and work and energy that's placed, and having really good partnerships and having other people who really understand what your intention and your core values are and doing your work is super important, at least for me to be able to do this work. So building all those, on those six months, I was able to come in, select a core team of 10 local artists uh, that are both committed to their artwork but also have a really strong commitment in involving the community within their creative process. And so this is a, this is a way, and a lot of my cultural envoys and a lot of the work that I've done abroad is a way to really support the local artists and sustain the work in the community beyond the life of the project. So that's really important and I come at it in a point of view of not, I don't have all the knowledge. What I do is I, I can build from what they've already worked on and they can build on what I can offer and choose what works for them as they move forward within their work in communities. And so through my, through my techniques, it's not just about sharing how to make a large scale mural, but it's also about finding strategies to really engage the community in a genuine way. So in November 2015, we created a two six story, we created two six story murals, um, 60 feet tall, at the new housing that was built for over 80 Masawa and Otomi families. The murals uses symbols of their culture, the native language, which is not Spanish, it's Otomi, it, the Otomi speak Nyanyu, and they reflect um, the images uh, in the mural reflect their migration and their struggles as they uh, were able to finally move from living in the streets to then fi finally living in their apartment buildings. It gave them a moment to come together to reflect and connect and also find ways to uh, depict their history, depict their story through images and messages.
so Doña Francisca, who you see at the very top of the mural, uh, she's an Otomi woman in her 70s, and she witnessed every stage of the migration. Uh, she was able to witness leaving her hometown, her pueblo, migrating to the city, living in the streets, which were these makeshift houses called casones, is where they were able to build and find empty lots and build and these these houses. That's that's what I mean about them living in the streets. And a lot of them have lived in the streets for 15 to 20 years, as I mentioned. And now she was able to see, to see and realize and, and call this new place a safe place that is her home. And she said during the creative sessions, I'm so happy that I don't have to carry my life on my back anymore. And so this feeling of pride, this feeling of being able to see all of those stages, um, and also for the, for the young <coughs> students, uh, well, in, in, I say students because there were indigenous youth that actually helped in the creation of the mural. They were able to really hear her story uh, and really identify and, and understand what this meant for them. While we were creating that mural, some of the families were just moving into their apartments, meaning in the creation of the mural, most of those families, which were about in that building, 45 families, most of them were still living in the street and just moving into their apartment buildings. One thing that was really beautiful about this, this moment in time was that a lot of the youth were embarrassed in wearing their traditional clothing and most importantly were beginning to lose uh, and, or forget how to speak Nyanyu, which is their native language. And by asking these questions and creating these intergenerational discussions, we were able to kind of, um, in a sense, inspire the elders to begin to offer classes so that the youth could begin to learn or reclaim the language again. So this is the, the final mural. And what was also really amazing, as you see in the little balconies, we were able to have some of the elders come up in the balconies and not on the scaffolding and actually paint on parts of the mural as we were working on it. So in, in the same year, which was 2015, I presented my Familia Separadas project uh, through a series of temporary site-specific public artworks and audio testimonials that marked the locations and stories of immigrant families affected by deportations in the city. The artwork entitled, It is Mi Todo, You Are My Everything, depicts the portrait of Maria and her daughter. And the work was placed on top of the compass rose by Edmund Bacon, where the statue of William Penn stands in the center of our city, and it also where it marks north, south, east, and west. Um, and I also want to mention that, you know, in a city where we have William Penn, who people often forget he was also an immigrant, um, that we are uh, in a city where we hold uh, close to 50,000 undocumented families uh, who lived and called Philadelphia their home. Uh, Maria's husband lived in Philadelphia and was deported. He attempted to cross the border again to be reunited with his family. He was caught by ICE in Texas, served a three-year jail sentence in California, and was deported to Mexico. So I say this because when people think about deportations, they think, oh, I'm detained, I'm going to deport it, this is going to happen tomorrow or in a week from now. And so uh, the detention system really falls within the system of the larger picture of mass incarceration and how it affects, still to this day, both uh, communities of color and specifically in terms of deportation um, are, are the uh, Latino community that's definitely affected. So deportations have separated over two million families. Uh, many times women have been forced to choose between their children and the father of their children uh, because in most cases men are most likely are the ones to be deported and forcing many women who become single mothers. Uh, and this drives the immigrant community deeper into poverty because you have two people that are working, or one is working and the other is being able, the mother is able to be present in the lives of their children. And then it shifts when one of the other, the spouse is no longer there, and now the mother has to take the larger responsibility of working and not being present at the home. So Maria continues to live in Philadelphia. She has five children that she's taking care of, and she speaks in her interview and in her audio that's connected to this piece. She speaks about the difficulty of making a decision to stay or leave uh, to be in Mexico and reunited with her husband. Um, this is her son, uh, who stands in front of the, the piece that was installed. 
Eres mi todo uh, came from one of the many letters that Jose sent to Maria while he was um, serving his three-year sentence in California. And Eres mi todo translates to You are my everything, and that's his actual handwriting that was recreated um, for the piece. The United States has invested billions of dollars to deport immigrants and build borders, but nothing has really been done to address the root causes of immigration. So many people across the world are forced to leave their homelands due to violence and conflict, oftentimes conflict initiated by U.S. interests or lack of economic security due to U.S. economic policies forced upon the countries in Latin America. So this is known as forced migration. Te Amo is a, a gold necklace that Suyapa proudly wears on her chest that is uh, a memory of her oldest daughter that she always carries with her. And Suyapa left Honduras fleeing violence. She crossed the border with her two youngest daughters and was detained in Texas and is now fighting her deportation proceedings in Philadelphia. So the image of Suyapa's necklace stands in close proximity to the Robert Indiana love sculpture where obviously people are there taking selfies and, uh, or other people are taking pictures of them. Uh, and also in the summertime, a lot of families play in the fountain. This is the old love park. The new love park doesn't look like this anymore. Um, but so Yapa, you know, we talk about what happens to love when uh, you leave or when you're forced to leave. So Yapa has left behind two sons in Honduras. Uh, and with her family, her family there, she wasn't able to bring her two sons. And she talks, every time I ask her how are her sons, she says, I'm, I'm losing them, right? The, the relationship is, has been uh, broken or affected, um, and, but she's also trying to fight to stay in this country to be able to provide a better life for her family back home. Uh, the Ninth Street Market is uh, the oldest open air market in the United States. It's at uh, it is at this intersection that you see here where newly arrived Mexican and Central, Amer Central American immigrants have opened and maintained businesses. This is the community where I live. I actually live a block away from here where I was born and raised and where I continue to live uh, to this day. Um, and uh, it is at this intersection where you see, we call it 9th Street, some people call it the Italian market. Um, but the, the reality is, is that from, from where you see the image on the ground over, um, were businesses that have been revitalized by the Mexican and Central American immigrants. And then the other half is really owned by third generation Italian immigrants that at times forget their own immigrant history. And so it's at this intersection where uh, community member Cruz, who is depicted in the portrait, rides his bicycle to work every day. So while working one day, he was detained by ICE and was sent home with a probation bracelet. He had to wear the bracelet for four months and could only leave the house for 12 hours. Every two weeks, ICE agents would search his house and he had to report to them for one full year at the ICE offices. Uh, the criminalization of Latinos has created a deportation machine that profits off of the detention and deportation of the immigrant community. So in the case of Cruz, he had to use that ankle bracelet. Um, and it's a perfect example of how private businesses profit from working with ICE and from being able to, for each, each probation bracelet you see is uh, a business, that private business profiting from that individual. Because that probation bracelet has a fee that needs to be uh, paid, uh, is a rental fee, and it's, it doesn't serve really any other purpose. Because although uh, uh, Cruz had to still go to the offices and report himself, he still had to have this physical reminder that he was being monitored all the time. Um, so in, in conclusion, in terms of this part, is that the more people de um, detained and deported, the more money these bi private businesses make. So the portrait of Cruz was chalk sprayed onto the, this asphalt uh, in, at this intersection. Uh, and there's also this phrase that says, se siente el miedo, that's what this piece is entitled, which means I still feel the fear. And so as the cars are passing by, as people are walking on top of this image, the image is slowly uh, erase, erasing away, slowly um, 
washing away with the traffic that's going on, on top of him. And so the, the thought and the idea is what happens when individuals that can contribute to our city are slowly, slowly disappearing because of the deportation machine, right? The absence of the individual that is, is contributing, not just to our economy, but to the livelihood um, uh, and, and uh, spirit of our, of our communities. And so in, in the case of Cruz, he talked about how the city felt like a place of freedom, and now it felt more like a prison. The first step of deportation begins at the Immigration Customs Enforcement Building. And it's on 16th, and, which is located on 16th and Callahill Streets. It is at this location where I installed a 90-foot long stenciled image along with community members from Juntos, an immigrant rights organization that I was working with. Um, the stencil shows the words of Ana, who is an undocumented mother who was unjustly deported to Guatemala. A judge issued her return, which is really rare within this process, and she continues to fight against her deportation in the United States. On the evening of Columbus Day in quotations, of, uh, October 12, 2015, uh, we were able to install the words of Ana as ICE agents looked down on us uh, in front of the ICE building on 16th and Cowell Hill. This piece was centrally located at the entrance where detained loved ones are transported out to jails and prisons awaiting their deportation proceedings. We are human beings risking our lives for our families and our future. And what I want to add is that at that moment and in that evening, as ICE agents were looking down on us, um, you know, I was able to bring the undocumented families who were some of the volunteers along with other allies that came to be with us in that, e in that evening um, they wouldn't even step foot through that space or even in front of this building because of this building represents fear. And so what you saw in the time lapse and, and for that moment was a moment where we all came together and everyone was fearless in being able to write down the words of Anna. And how these words are much more, uh, are as equally as powerful as shut down ice and not one more, but it's really coming from a community member. And so how do I use, utilize this space utilize public space to really amplify that voice and amplify that message. Ana was one of the families detained at the Burks uh, Family Prison in Pennsylvania. Uh, Burks is one of three family prisons in the United States where children as young as two weeks old have been incarcerated. The center has a laundry list of human rights abuses which led the federal court to revoke their license and order the immediate release of the families. Fourteen families were detained for more than two years, the longest that any other family has been detained, and this is happening, has happened in our state. And during that time, they, the families organized labor and hunger strikes as they were fighting for their freedom. Unfortunately, ten families, after serving those two years, were deported back to their home country and back to the very same conditions and the violence that they were fleeing from the first place. And four families were released that are still fighting against their deportation and living through the trauma of being detained. So this year, due to inactivity from Governor Tom Wolf, the center's license uh, was renewed and continues to detain families to this day, mothers, fathers, and children. Children, again, as young as my son, who's three years old, two teenagers, um, are in this family prison. So my recent work, Seguimos Caminando, We Keep Walking, is a moving monument on the gates of City Hall that brings to the forefront the stories written by detained undocumented mothers through a series of animated projections. And the project was featured through Monument Lab, a public art history project produced by Mural Arts and also the curators, um, Paul Farber and Ken Lum. And in my monument, I'm honoring the mothers who uh, are, are detained at Berks or were recently released uh, from the Berks Detention Center. And uh, from March to August, I worked. I met with two mothers. Uh, one mother is from Honduras. The other mother is from El Salvador. Uh, that have been detained. Were detained at the center for more than 600 days, uh, both with their now five and seven-year-old sons. The two mothers uh, are four. Are the, are the two our mothers are coming from those four families that were released, and um, as I mentioned. The stories based on the animated projections were based on the writings uh, throughout my sessions and conversations with the mothers. 
And here is a short animation clip. Uh, this piece was actually, the animation was then projected onto the gates of City Hall, the north gates of City Hall, uh, for an entire month. And this is what part of the animation. Soy la hija de la tierra, soy 
semejante que cultiva las frutas y su hacienda. Soy el rocío que se rica fulminante. Yo soy luz de sol, arcoíris penetrante. Soy el dulce, soy celada. Soy la pluma de la flecha, la reina con su danza. Soy la esperanza de mi pueblo. Soy la promesa en grande, soy la sombra de este suelo. Soy el consuelo, soy la cura. Soy la figura más pura, soy la nieve, soy la bruma. Soy la cascada que se entra por cantarata. La súbita remata de vida que nos retrata. Yo soy la piel de todos. Soy el coco de nieve que llora por tus ojos. Soy esa fuerza que se precipita del centro del camino donde nace la semilla. Harrisburg 
and, and to, to amplify them and also to, to help the coalition and the work that they're doing. So long, long answer is, is yeah, oh, the short answer is yes, I'll be, I'll be doing that. Have you made any public art um, about your own family's immigration story? No, a lot of the work that I've done, um, the, the first couple of images that you saw, uh, were all about my family history. So, um, and I tend to do that more in my studio. So I just had a, a solo show at Taller Puerto Riqueño. Um, and at, that, at the solo show, it was all based on my family history. So this, this wanting to know more about people's stories and, and the, um, I guess, the, the importance of knowing our stories really comes from my own exploration in my studio that then had like, in 1999, expanded into public spaces and with communities. One more quick thing, do you have a website? Yes, I do, michelleangela.com. Thank you. And that's Michelle with two L's. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here. It was a very good um, presentation. Um, but one thing that's sort of implicit in your um, in your presentation, but which I would like to hear you um, expand more about, is what is the relationship between art and social change? Because it seems like that's a very deep um, idea underlying your work. Absolutely. Um, how I go about talking, so there's, there's many writings or, or folks that I kind of look to um, as examples that really speak about like ethics and responsibility and in my mind it's also about dignity and respect, right? And so, um, so one, one um, writer, her name's Arlene Goldbart, who has written a lot about ethics in community arts. There's another uh, writer, his name's uh, Robert uh, Bedoya, who talks about creative placemaking. So this concept of like, I just made your neighborhood better because I have all these murals and it's great, or I just changed your playground. And then, um, but then the community says, well, I really didn't ask you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And so where is that process where you begin to have these conversations and, and enter into these spaces? Um, so in the case of uh, the indigenous communities, um, I had to learn a lot through Abidahis and their work before I even stepped foot to do any of the work there to understand um, how is the way that we can communicate and build uh, together without, and trying to be conscious of without imposing what my own thoughts or ideas of how this is supposed to be, uh, without imposing that, right? Uh, but on the other end, um, what I can honestly say about uh, Burks, for example, was that I know that I have the power and the privilege to come in and out of the center at any time. I also know that I have the power and the privilege to grab those stories from the mothers and edit it in any which way that I want it, right? Um, and in some cases, people say, well, that's artistic license. You know, you're, you're going through this process and for, for the sake of the art, you have to make these edits. Um, and I say no otherwise, right? Because for me, it was so important that uh, these women have gone through so much and I came at a moment in time where 10 of their best friends were deported. So, and then they were, they were at a time where they were hanging in the balance and they didn't know if they were gonna remain here or not. Um, so I came at a very sensitive time and I also had to be sensitive to that in the way that I approached it. And so, um, so I didn't come to the mothers asking them about, let's write a campaign letter or let's, what are we gonna say to Tom Wolf? Like, they were just over that, right? They were like, what's going to happen to us? So I asked my question to them in our conversations uh, were, what gives you strength? And uh, the next question was, um, um, what was the moment that you felt the most free? And so those two questions were kind of like the foundation of the conversations that we had because it's really not about you know, they're in this detention center and people see them as victims, but they're really heroines, right? There are these women that have um, crossed countries before they even arrive to be detained and are surviving these obstacles with their children. And they're, they're, they are, even though they're worried, they're able to still smile at their child and give them the assurance that everything is okay. And for me, that's amazing. For me, that's inspirational, right? 
And so <clears throat> that's when I talk about change happens on both ends, right? So however horrible my day is, or like, oh, we have to drive, my cousin is he's here, and he can attest to it. We have to drive an hour and a half to Berkeley. It's like, <clears throat> it seems so in insignificant to that moment and that experience and the strength that these women have. And so, um, so when I think of art and social change, I think about um, how are we conscious of the spaces and the people we're connecting with? How are we sensitive <clears throat> to the trauma that they've dealt with? And how do we utilize this moment to remind them of how powerful they are when everyone else sees them as powerless, right? Um, that's a more open and vague and inspirational. <laughs> <clears throat> but then there's all these, um, as I mentioned, these writings and these philosophies of how to come into these spaces. Um, but I always come to the core of, if you don't know who you are, and what your own prejudices are, what your own experiences are, um, if I don't know who I am, I cannot come into that space. And I can't, I can't be willing to ask them a question that I myself am not willing to answer. It has to be reciprocal, right? Um, and, and I feel that in this practice, that's really important, right? Because what you see is, is this sometimes watered down version, um, or, or it's just hitting the surface. For me personally, I want to make sure that, that the women, whether they're inside or out, they feel that they've been represented in the most authentic way that I could in the work that I'm doing. And that takes time, and that takes process, and it takes um, patience <laughs> to do that. So. And that's my response. Everyone's good. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, if there's, a, are there any more questions? If there aren't any more questions, um, as I mentioned, uh, my website's michelleangelo.com. There's a way to contact me. I'm also on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, I always am looking for um, people who uh, feel connected or want to learn more, volunteers, folks to participate or uh, find ways to connect with how to do this work. And um, and I'm also very much connected with other artists that uh, are, not as, are doing this work with the um, a social justice lens, but they might do another thing. So they do photography or they do dance. Or, so I just want to open that up into that space and, and not be, do not be afraid to approach me or see me as a resource that then I can um, make some uh, connections or offer some information <laughs> that could be helpful within your, your process. So thank you again for inviting me.